freedom of information law after a year of litigation, they sent us a letter which is posted on CHD's website that acknowledges that they are now not able to locate a single pre-licensing safety trial placebo control for any of the vaccines that are now mandated for children. These are zero liability vaccines. And so if I might interject in just limited time, and I hope you can expand on that further, I know my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, will probably expand on this later, but your, your uncle, Senator Ted Kennedy, was a pretty strong opponent of sweeping immunity from liability for manufacturers of vaccines, and did he not introduce an amendment to repeal the so-called PREP Act, uh, the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, uh, when he was a senator? Yes, he did, and uh, you know, th that, the immunity which was passed in 1986, not, neither the Republicans or Democrats wanted it. Uh, Ronald Reagan at that time, who signed the bill, said, and Wyeth was the company that was pushing it, and they were saying that they were losing $20 in downstream liabilities for every dollar that they made in profits from vaccines. They were gonna get out of the business if they were not granted immunity. Uh, Ronald Reagan said to them at that time, why don't you make the vaccines safe? And why is that? Because they're unavoidably unsafe, which is true of most medicines. I'm not anti-vaccine, but I think we need to be honest and we need to have good science. That's all and, I've ever argued. And, and closing out my time here, I would just say this. My, my father had polio. Um, I understand the ravages of that disease. I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to have a polio vaccine, but I also want the truth being sought. I want to know the health impacts of the polio vaccine going forward and every other vaccine that's being administered. And I'll just close by saying and asking, I know that this is informed by a great deal of conversations you've had with mothers and moms who came up to you. And if you could expand on that, I'll yield back. Yeah, I mean, I was dragged kicking and screaming into this space because I was confronted by, uh, you know, when I was touring the country on uh, suing companies about mercury and fish. And by the way, People, you know, I spent 30 years trying to get mercury out of the fish in this country, and nobody ever called me any fish. <laughs> At that time, I, I, we were trying to get mercury out of vaccines because mothers were coming and saying, my child was injured by the vaccine. These were many, many hundreds, literally, of mothers with intellectual disabilities. And they said, nobody's listening to us. The Democrats aren't listening to us. Republicans aren't listening to us, and I felt like I should listen to them and actually read the science, and that is what got me down into the time. And by the way, it's the worst career decision I have ever made. <laughs> time of the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. You'll back. Time of the gentleman inspired. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member Plaska. During the height of COVID-19, pan the COVID-19 pandemic, anti-Asian hate and violence skyrocketed as some racists blamed a virus coming out of China on all Asian Americans. Since March of 2020, Stop AAPI Hate, a nonprofit organization aimed at tracking and addressing anti-Asian hate, reported more than 11,000 anti-Asian acts of hate and violence. This same report found that 49% of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have experienced some form of discrimination. These acts of hate include Asian Americans being beaten, spit on, screamed at, and even killed. And the increases in these types of attacks during COVID accompanied a slew of anti-Chinese sentiments related to the virus, like calling it the quote-unquote China virus and even disgustingly quote-unquote Kung flu. Many Asian Americans were harassed, physically accosted, and told that they quote-unquote created the virus. Yet one of our Republican witnesses encourages this appalling rhetoric and promotes anti-Asian hate with dangerous and unfounded claims. Just last week, Mr. Kennedy suggested COVID-19 was a bioweapon and said it was, quote, targeted to attack Caucasians and black people, end quote, and that, quote, the people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese, end quote, suggesting that the Chinese people didn't suffer like others during the pandemic. Despite asserting that he should become their president, Mr. Kennedy seems to disregard the correlation between anti-Asian rhetoric and violence. Ms. Wiley, do you frequently work with minority communities, including Chinese American or other Asian American communities? I do. And do you think Mr. Kennedy's theory is racist? I think that Mr. Kennedy's statements fuels the theories that suggest that there's a biology to race and that therefore we can actually identify people in communities as possibly either being benefited by 
or being people who are not sharing the same interests and needs as the rest of us. And yes, that has served to drive hate and bias and sadly, including violent incidents. Now, it was said earlier in this hearing that Mr. Kennedy is a smart man. Now, so far as I know, he does not have any specific education or training in medicine. He is not an epidemiologist, one who studies infectious diseases. He has never conducted clinical trials in a professional setting. He has never done scientific research in a professional laboratory and published scientific findings in a peer-reviewed publication. Ms. Wiley, what kind of harm does someone with absolutely no medical training or knowledge do when they espouse unfounded anti-Asian vaccine theories during a fraught time like COVID? One of the things that happened in this historic pandemic was that there was um, certainly a need to get on top of very quickly what the science said. I am not a scientist either. And so what social media platforms did was go and speak to government agencies because their own policies, and their own uh, user agreements required them to look and figure out what the facts were so that they could assess what was responsible and what was not responsible to post. I say that because it was incredibly important to ensure that people were getting real-time information as possible, but also ones that really demonstrated what all of us need, uh, rather than where and how we should um, ascribe blame or where and how we should consider who benefits and who doesn't because we were all harmed. But I say this in part because it was the social media platforms themselves that reached out to government agencies, including Health and Human Services and CDC to get that information. And under the vacated, the vacated opinion, which is really important to understand, it has been vacated by the Fifth Circuit, this preliminary injunction on all these incidents that we're talking about, because, because one of the things it would do, in my view, just as my, in my legal view, is that it was actually saying that the government could not respond to such requests under this injunction, which is incredibly overbroad, dangerous, and doesn't allow government agencies to do what they are chartered to do. Now, I'm an attorney by training, and one of the things I learned very early on in constitutional law is that no right given to the people of the United States is absolute, and that includes the right to free speech, because you do not have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater, because it could produce harm and death of people by being false. These social media platforms have user policies to try to prevent that kind of harm. Is that not correct, Mrs. W Ms. Wiley? That is correct. And so we are not trying to censor speech. We are simply trying to create factually correct information to prevent harm to people, including death. And that's what we, they were trying to do during COVID. Is that not correct? Legally speaking, absolutely. And I say that as a matter of law, which is that court cases say that the government has the, in fact, it's its role to ask for compliance with policies. The policies on the books of social media I'm, platforms I'm the, were violated. I'm and the they Excuse said me, those Mr. Chairman, but the last questioner got an additional extra minute. I'm at 35 seconds over. Yeah. I would Point just of order, Mr. Chairman. The Democrat finish, beforehand got an extra finish minute. Finish her sentence. I'm trying to be generous. I'm finish her sentence. Trying to be generous, even when the response is that the government determines the truth. I'm I would to like be for her to be able to finish her sentence, Mr. Chairman, then I will yield back. Okay, Ms. Wiley, you can finish your sentence. Thank you. I'm not sure I remember the sentence, but okay. thank you. Okay. I just I think the point I was, it was. I do. Uh, you were saying the government record. should be the arbiter Can you of what's please truth. Please not put That's words action. into the mouth of the witness yeah. and let her respond. The chair it's now her recognizes answer. the gentlelady from New York, the gentlelady from California. I love how you expired. follow the rules, the Mr. Is, Chairman. It's is, really indicative of what a kangaroo uh, court this is and what a it's circus it is. Censorship by the chair. It's censorship by the chair. Oh, Lord. The gentlelady Thank you, Mr. From Chairman. New York is Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Morris, isn't it true that your October 2020 Hunter Biden laptop from Hell story has proven to be 100% factually accurate? I was 27 when I published that story. It better have been. <laughs> isn't it true that the FBI obtained Hunter Biden's laptop a full 10 months before your story broke? That's correct, according to the subpoena that I published. 
isn't it also true that we now know that the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force coerced social media companies into an alleged forthcoming Russian, quote, hack and leak operation, and as a result, illegally censored the Hunter Biden laptop story? Isn't that true? Yes. And this forced censorship by government agencies like the FBI was paid for by the taxpayer, since the taxpayers fund the FBI. Isn't that true? Yes. And Hunter Biden's laptop from hell, it has everything. It's a hellhole and cesspool of corruption and criminal conduct. It has hard drugs, prostitution, pornography, money laundering. It has Biden family shell companies, communist Chinese, corrupt foreign government deals from tens of millions of dollars in exchange for access to the Biden family. The Hunter Biden laptop from hell has all of this, correct? Yeah. And the American people are smart. They know that this was not a hack and dump. This was illegal government censorship to protect and prop up Joe Biden on the eve of the 2020 election. And according to polling, of people who were now made aware of the Hunter Biden laptop story, 53% would have changed their vote, including 61% of Democrats. So do you agree that the censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop story was determinative in the 2020 election, Ms. Morris? Yeah, there are various polls that say that um, that there would have been a change in the outcome of the election, and obviously it's immediately relevant to a decision on who to vote for, so obviously. And do you believe that this government censorship was election interference? Yes. Any, any censorship of speech prevents um, your ability to think clearly. Yes, of course. Yes. And Mr. Kennedy, I want to turn to you. You've heard me lay out this example of egregious and illegal government censorship. You have been censored yourself. Do you believe that government censorship is a form of election interference? Yeah, I, mean, I think government, I think democracy is dependent on the free flow of information. And if we, if that information is distorted, if the public is lied to, then it interferes with election. And by the way, it interferes with public health. And the Wall Street Journal did an article a couple of weeks ago suggesting that the censorship of important health information cost American lives. And Mr. Kennedy, I want to ask you specifically about the Hunter Biden laptop story. The total blackout on all social media outlets as well as telecom. You couldn't text the link to the Hunter Biden laptop story. This specifically was a form of election interference by the U.S. government in the 2020 election. I don't know enough about it. I know that uh, there was censorship on that story and other stories that, uh, you know, presumably um, could have changed people's minds about the election. And we know the polling demonstrates that now. People have said they would have changed their vote had they been made aware of the Hunter Biden laptop story. Isn't that correct? I am not aware of that, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, Mr. Sauer, uh, I want to turn to you. Um, you, I, I want your reflection on this form of government censorship, specifically in the 2020 election, as a form of election interference, and what I believe is some of the, you know, most egregious political scandals that, you know, I will live through in my lifetime. Mr. Sauer, what are your reflections? I strongly agree with your characterization of that form of censorship as election interference. Uh, the evidence in our case strongly supports that. Uh, it strongly supports, and actually we have judicial findings now, that the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story was done at the instigation of federal officials in the FBI at a very high level of that organization. It was an orchestrated campaign of de deception that was anticipatory, it was planned in advance, and it was, I think, uh, consummated with the testimony that I hadn't seen before that's been put up today from Ms. Demlo uh, characterizing how, at the very end, the FBI then uh, 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 clammed up at the last minute after spending months of seeding the record in these endless, ceaseless meetings with social media platforms about there's a hack and dump coming, it's going to involve Hunter Biden. Then when it actually came, they said, well, no comment. Our, our judge focused on that particular issue as kind of the coup de grace in this form of election interference. Thank you. My time's expired. Mr. Chairman, Mr. point Chairman, of order. I have back. a unanimous consent request. The young lady from California is recognized for unanimous consent.
My majority counterparts have repeatedly cited a district court opinion from Louisiana, and I would like to introduce for the record the Fifth Circuit order staying that opinion almost as soon as it was issued. Objection. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Um, the distinguished gentle lady from New York mentioned a, a poll. Um, I would just ask that she identify what poll that is and if we could enter it into the record. I'm sure she'll be happy to We will to do submit that. it for the record. Can you identify what it is? Sure, I will submit it for the record and you'll be able to review it. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. Uh, the chair now recognizes the uh, gentle lady from uh, Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we respectfully requested that you rescind Mr. Kennedy's invitation to be, appear here due to his repeated and very recent statements that spread dangerous anti-Semitic and anti-Asian conspiracy theories and attempted to move into executive session because House rules prohibit public testimony that degrades or defames people. His reckless rhetoric helped fuel anti-Semitic incidents, which for the record are at the highest level in the United States since 1970. They have nearly tripled in the last six years. Since you gave Mr. Kennedy a megaphone today, I want to give him a chance to correct his statements and prepare some of the harm that he's helped cause. Mr. Kennedy, you're well educated. So yes or no, please. Are you aware that for centuries, Jews have been scapegoated and blamed for causing illnesses like Black Plague and more recently COVID? I am. Those are known as blood libel, and they are one of the worst and most disturbing parts of uh, human history. Good. I'm glad to know that, of course, that you, that you acknowledge that. Of course, it's true and well documented that this pernicious form of anti-Semitism led to centuries of discrimination, even horrific pogroms and massacres, and it still fuels deadly violence today. Yet last week, you floated a baseless conspiracy theory that the coronavirus was bioengineered to target Caucasians and black people, but to spare Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people. Mr. Kennedy, your bizarre, unproven claim echoes that same historic slander of labeling Jews and Chinese people as a race, and that Jews, and in this case Chinese people, somehow managed to avoid a deadly illness that targets other groups for death. You do see that, yes or no? You're misstating. No, 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 no. Uh, you I, are... quoted, I quoted what you said earlier, and it, it is directly what you said. So just ask me, uh, yes no, or no? I was, I was describing an NIH-funded study. No, 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 you didn't cite any. I was, as, I was describing an NIH-funded study by Cleveland Clinic Reclaiming scientists. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. You did not you, reference. Reclaiming my time. Published in USC Mr. Medical, Chairman, which is, is one of... The time is mine. I'm reclaiming it. Please ask the witness to stop talking. You asked me a question. Reclaiming I, let me, Allow me to time. answer my question. Mr. Chairman, I'd like about 10 uh, seconds the back. Time, the time you belongs. You are slandering me time incorrectly. To the, the time belongs time to You're saying time. is dishonest. Time belongs to the gentlelady from Florida. I need to defend myself. Mr. Chairman, time belongs to the gentlelady from Florida. I'd like 15 seconds back. We will Mr. be Chairman. happy to give you that. Thank you so much. You did not cite any study like you are citing here now during that conversation. You referenced no study at all. You simply labeled Jews and Chinese people as a race, and you also said that somehow they managed to avoid a deadly illness that targets other groups for death. You don't see that. You're trying to rewrite history here. A few months ago, Mr. Kennedy, you compared COVID public health policies to barbaric murderous tactics of Nazi Germany, saying that Jewish people in Nazi Germany had more freedom than Americans facing COVID health restrictions. In hindsight, Mr. Kennedy, do you reject this absurd and deeply hurtful and harmful com comparison, or do you still stand by it? Congressman, what you are saying is a lie. That you, you said it. It's, it's, I no, I did not. I never continued. Okay. I never, ever Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer into the record when Mr. Kennedy said that. I reclaim my time. In discussing COVID public health measures, you made light of the genocide against Jewish people by saying, and I quote, even Hitler's Germany, you could cross the Alps to Switzerland. You could hide in an attic like Anne Frank did. Mr. Kennedy, do you think it was easy for Jewish people to escape systematic slaughter of Nazis, yes or no? Absolutely not. Okay, good. Mr. Kennedy, do you think it was just as hard to wear a mask during COVID as it was to hide under floorboards or false walls so you weren't murdered or dragged to a concentration camp? Yes or no? Excuse me? Uh, that's a question, yes or no? I didn't hear your question. Okay, I said, do you think it was just as hard to wear a mask during COVID as it was to hide under floorboards or false walls so you weren't murdered or dragged to a concentration camp? Of course not, that's okay. ridiculous. But that's a comparison that you made. I Mr. did not Kennedy, make that the comparison. Measures taken were the measures taken to contain the spread and fatalities related to COVID in any way at all comparable to the murder of six million Jews, yes or no? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. 
<laughs> let's be very clear here. There's no legitimate comparison to the Holocaust. It doesn't matter if you're talking about AI, AI, vaccine mandates, or anything else. There is no comparison. And if this were a slip of the tongue, Mr. Kennedy, or a one-off comment, we would all move on. But there's a deeply disturbing pattern. In 2015, you apologized to all those, quote, whom I offended by my use of the word Holocaust to describe the autism epidemic. When discussing efforts to encourage others to get vaccinated for COVID-19, you said Nazis did that in the camps in World War II. They tested vaccines on gypsies and Jews. That was a quote. Like before, you apologized for invoking the Holocaust, saying, quote, to the extent my remarks caused hurt, I am truly and deeply sorry. These are not real statements of contrition or remorse. They are passive-aggressive non-apologies that blame the listener for reacting to the lie you just spread. I'm deeply saddened that this is a conversation we're having today. I have deep respect for what Mr. Kennedy's family did and still does to make life better for all Americans. But what you are doing now, Mr. Kennedy, and the forces you aligned yourself are reckless, dangerous, and disturbing by echoing dangerous claims such as, quote, Jews don't really suffer as much as we do, which you said, your rhetoric creates a climate of mistrust, antagonism, and even hatred or violence against Jewish people. My own children have been the targets of brutal anti-Semitism on social media. You fan those flames and jeopardize their safety. You've marginalized other groups too, like Asian Americans and the LGBT plus community. And worse, you don't seem to care or brush it all off to misquotes and misunderstanding. Frankly, it's disgusting. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance. Mr. Of Delaney, Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous consent request. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for UC. I ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a study that Mr. Kennedy just referenced, uh, new insights into genetic susceptibility of COVID-19. Uh, the main body said that they investigated genetic susceptibility to COVID-19 by examining DNA polymorphism in ACE2 and TMPRSS2. Those are receptors for COVID in 81,000 human genomes, and they found unique genetic susceptibility across different populations. I have another uh, document that I'd like to ask unanimous consent. Without objection. To submit, and this is uh, from the FDA, FDA Review of Efficacy and Safety of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 Vaccine. This is dated December 10th, 2020, and it shows that the uh, Pfizer trial and the USDA broke down the effectiveness of the vaccine into seven different racial categories because this was also a concern of theirs, and it would frankly be delinquent not to study the, uh, the effects across the But Mr. Kennedy said objection. it was bioengineered well, to, uh, oh, to, to target time, time blacks and Caucasians. The, the gentleman from Utah is recognized for whites, five minutes. And spare Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people. Uh, that is different than the belongs to the gentleman Thank you. from Utah. Thank you, claiming my time. Mr. Kennedy, you've had uh, s some accusations uh, thrown at you today. I'm going to ask my questions briefly and give you a chance to respond to that at the end of my time here. Ms. Wiley, if I could talk to you, uh, and, I, and maybe you're busy, you know, with something else there, but uh, do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people should be exposed to? Uh, I, I trust that we have a process whereby we can interrogate that, what we hear and learn from that, the government, but certainly I expect the government to share facts and information. That, that, that wasn't my had. question. I didn't say share facts and information. I said, do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people should be exposed to and which ones they should not? Uh, well, I think I'm struggling with the question because that is not the simple, facts of the case in Missouri. Question, simple in question. Missouri versus I'm not talking Biden, about Missouri. I'm not talking about Missouri. Hey, 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 hey. I'm not talking about Missouri. This is a very simple question. Do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people are exposed to? I am not aware of any action of the government okay, that tells I'm take the that. American public what facts they should be exposed You're to. You're not aware of that? No, I am not. Oh my gosh, where have you lived for the last three years? In the United States of okay, America. Let me tell you, let me ask you, China suppresses free speech, is that a good thing? No, of course not. Iran, Mullah's air suppress free speech, is that a good thing? No, of course. Vladimir not. Putin expresses uh, suppresses. Is that a good thing? No, we we all so agree, can we we agree should not suppress then, free speech. We agree then that the government should not, government leaders should not suppress free speech. Do oh, that, agree with that? That, that's a different question. Uh, yes, it is. It is unconstitutional How for the government to pass laws that would abridge free speech. Okay. That's or, the first or, or not pass laws, but to create pressure that would suppress free speech. They don't. Vladimir Putin doesn't pass a law. He yes, exerts but, his force and influence to suppress free speech. Yes, the case law says that the government cannot 
coerce private entities. No, and we agree that's a bad idea, don't we? Yes, and I would absolutely agree when we Donald agree, Trump. We agree, and the government when Donald Trump threatened wait, 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 social we, media companies. Hang on, with hang on, federal hang regulation hang shut on. down. That was coercion. That's not my question. Oh, I know, but I think it was consistent to here's, show that we here's agree. Here's my question for you. We agree, the government shouldn't be responsible for restricting views that the American people are exposed to. We agree on that, right? You wouldn't answer it at first. Oh. But that's, it's clear that you do agree with that. That's because a different when, question. Okay, so to my question, do you agree with it or not? I agree that the government should not violate our Constitution. Do you agree with my question? Your question is should the government whether or determine, not the This is so no, simple. it is not so uh, no, simple No, I'm going to ask it one time, and it is so simple. A seventh grader could understand this question. Should the government be responsible for the views and the facts that the American people are exposed to. The, the problem I have is that I don't okay, know I'm of any that, facts I'm in which that you're the government to, tells us I'm what I'm going to say believe. that you're unable to answer a question, which for me is fairly shocking as an American citizen. Let me ask you now then, having concluded that you're unaware of suppression of free speech in the last several years, what about, for That's example... That's not actually what I said, but thank you. Do you think it was appropriate for the FBI to pressure private companies to censor and take down posts that the government disagreed with? Was that appropriate? I'll give you an example that you were unaware of. I'm glad you're aware of it now. Was that appropriate for the government to do that? Sir, the only thing that is appropriate for the government to do is what it is lawfully allowed to do, both under the Constitution and the laws of this country. Which is? which is to conduct its criminal investigations appropriately to our laws and to our policies. So they didn't have the ability then to go to these private companies and to say they can't there are instances There are instances in which, in order to protect the integrity of a criminal prosecution, they may ask, sometimes news agencies Cer and others certainly to agree withhold. with that. Was that the case yeah. here? Was uh, there any I, criminal prosecutions involved with these cases? Not that I'm there aware were criminal, of. Criminal investigations are not prosecutions. Okay, criminal and investigations. And also uh, the integrity of criminal. Were there any criminal investigations regarding these uh, examples? Uh, which examples are those, sir? For example, anything regarding the Hunter Biden laptop. Well, there are lots of things that have been said in public media about Hunter Biden's laptop. There, has, there was a criminal investigation, in fact, a plea in that case. Does it bother you that 51 former intelligence officials made a determination that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation, which they admit, by the way, they had no evidence at all that that was true. Zero evidence that that was true. Does that bother you they did that? What bothers me tremendously is that while there are a lot of things we should be talking about with regard to whether or not the government at times exceeds its authority, that includes whether or not government exceeds its authority when it tries to censor or interfere with research or research institutions where uh, any White House official, um, such as Donald Trump, actually threatens the full power of the federal government, including the threat to shut down social media because they put a fact the check label on the a tweet. Expired. Mr. I Chairman, I have a unanimous that. consent request. Gentlelady from New York is recognized. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record a tip insight to New Jersey-based Institute of Policy and Politics poll conducted of over 1,000 adults between August 2nd and August 4th of 2022 showed that 8 in 10 uh, voters, if they were made aware of the Biden laptop, that would have been determinative in changing the outcome of the election. It also demonstrates that 61 percent of Democrats included in this poll would have changed their vote. Submitted for the record. Not objection. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been in this Congress 15 years, and I never thought we'd descend to this level of Orwellian dystopia. Suddenly the tools of the trade are not to get at the truth, but to distract, distort, deflect, and dissemble. To disagree is censorship. To try to correct the facts is to infringe on my right of free speech. Of course, it only works one way. The name of 
Dr. Fauci has been invoked. I'd love to have him here as a witness to describe his travail in being censored. But of course, with that right-wing censorship comes intimidation and threat and intimations of violence. And a wink blink that, by the way, violence, you know, can be justified. The violence, for example, here on January 6th has been explicitly excused by some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle as a bunch of tourists who got a little out of hand, a little overexcited. Five are dead, including my constituent, Capitol Hill police officer, who died the next day from the trauma and shock of that experience. And ironically, talk about free speech and duty, he voted for Donald Trump. But his duty was to be here that day. Often a scolding. And somehow, my freedom to harm with the words I use is considered further evidence of censorship. But we know words have power. And that's why we take care with the words we use. We have mass killings in America. We buried people recently at Pittsburgh because of their identity. Hate speech has consequences. Distortion of the truth has consequences. It's not censorship to try to correct that record. Vaccination denial would have cost millions of more lives in America. 1.1 million fellow Americans are dead today because of the pandemic and millions are saved because of a vaccine that was developed in record time, and we ought to be celebrating that, not cavilling about it. Protective measures were taken to take down disinformation about vaccines and about the nature of the virus and about protective measures we could take, including masks including social distancing. It was not big brother government trying to exercise its will on, a, on an innocent population. It was public health measures to protect lives. Again, something should be celebrated. But no, there's an opportunity to have a conspiracy theory here. There's an opportunity to make political points. And no matter what you may think, Mr. Kennedy, and I revere your name, you're not here to propound your case for censorship. You are here for cynical reasons to be used politically by that side of the aisle to embarrass the current president of the United States, and you're an enabler in that effort today. And it brings shame on a storied name that I revere. I began my political interest with your father. And it makes me profoundly sad to see where we have descended today in this hearing. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Goldman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, the distinguished gentleman from Virginia. We don't have uh, a lot of time to dig into questions, um, but I would just note for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are former prosecutors, uh, you well know that the opinions of a journalist don't amount to actual evidence of anything, and it is a sign of the desperate attempt to satisfy your conspiracy theories that you're bringing a fringe right Gentlemen's order time. to provide evidence of your, for your investigation, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson from Louisiana. For I'm so grateful for that segue from Mr. Golden because we're about to talk about hard evidence here. It's really ironic this hearing is covering the left censorship of opposing viewpoints, and you've all seen it on display all day long. They've been 
doing exactly that. They've been trying to bully and defame our witnesses and, and, and try to cover up their opinions. They, they actually began the hearing with a motion to prevent them from testifying. You can't make this stuff up. It's on broad display for everybody. They did the same thing yesterday in the hearing with the IRS whistleblowers. You know why? Because the Democrats are panicked right now. They're panicked because it's impossible to cover up the inescapable conclusions of the last few weeks. Let me give you two of them. First, one, the hard evidence, Mr. Goldman and everybody else, now proves that the Biden family is hopelessly corrupt and has apparently engaged in a long pattern of extortion, bribery, influence peddling, and tax fraud, and staggering abuses of power. And number two, we're highlighting here today that we now know that a growing list of the most important executive branch agencies of the Biden administration are in on it. They've also been corrupted. They've been weaponized to help cover all this up, the first family's crimes. When we summarize all this stuff, it sounds like a premise of a dystopian novel or something, but it's actually happening right now on our watch. This is not conspiracy theories, this is evidence. Our hearing today is to put a spotlight on one more of these incredible avenues as unprecedented corruption and government cover-up. And here again, a federal court has just affirmed all that hard evidence. It proves that the White House, the Department of Justice, and the FBI, among other agencies, threatened and coerced the social media platforms to censor and suppress disfavored viewpoints and conservatives' social media posts online. I'm grateful we have with us today two individuals, Mr. Kennedy and Ms. Harris, who were directly impacted by that censorship, and the third, Mr. Sauer, who we're about to speak with, serving as lead counsel in the landmark lawsuit against the federal government on this issue. Let's talk facts. The American people are not aware of the magnitude of this case, Mr. Sauer, and its profound implications, because most of the mainstream media is in on it too, and they're trying to bury the story. In brief, in May of last year, the attorneys general of my state, Louisiana, and the state of Missouri filed suit in U.S. District Court of the Western District of Louisiana for this blatant censorship. They went after the blatant censorship by the Biden White House in nine of its federal agencies. Two weeks ago on Independence Day, the district court issued a truly extraordinary 155-page court opinion, a ruling granting the plaintiff's request for preliminary injunction. Mr. Sauer, your lead counsel in that litigation, you referenced some in your opening statement, but let's do it again here because they don't seem to be paying attention. Can you give a summary again of some of the key components of that opinion and the basis for it? I know you mentioned there were 82 pages of detailed factual findings, right? That is correct, 82 pages, 577 citations of the record evidence. That evidence is drawn from about 20,000 pages of the government's own communications with social media platforms and six full-length depositions of senior federal officials with firsthand knowledge of federal censorship practices. It's absolutely staggering. And now they've tried to bury this and say, well, the Fifth Circuit entered a temporary administrative stay. They granted a an expedited briefing and oral argument, however, for August 10th. What, what's the impact of that? That's a, isn't that routine practice in the Fifth Circuit? That's a direct quote from the recent Fifth Circuit decision, N. Ray Abbott, which is cited in my written testimony. It's legally incorrect, clearly legally incorrect to describe them as vacating the injunction, which has happened multiple times. They that either don't know right. the law or, I don't know, they're trying to obscure the facts. That's a theme around here. The White House and the fellow Democrats disputed almost none of the factual findings in the court. Isn't that right? So far, we've had two emergency stay motions from the Department of Justice, one in the District Court, one in the uh, Court of Appeals. And what really struck me in reading those is they just don't dispute those 82 pages of factual findings. Almost none of them are directly disputed in what they've filed so far. So at the very beginning of this lengthy opinion, the court explains the staggering scope of the government censorship uncovered here. At page two, the court explains, quote, if the allegations made by the plaintiffs are true, the present case arguably involves the most massive attack on free speech in United States history. The court called it dystopian, Orwellian. How broad has this attack been? How many Americans have been uh, censored? Do you think? There's judicial findings again and again in the opinion of millions, millions of American voices silenced by these efforts. And it had profound impacts. We know we just saw the poll and the, and the data that's been entered here, facts, not conjecture, that it ch probably changed the outcome of the election. The court noted that they suppressed, among other topics, the Hunter Biden laptop story. And the court noted, not you, not me, not Republicans, that millions of Americans were not exposed to that story. Had they been, we know they might have voted differently. We'll never be able to unwind history, but wow, I mean, the profound impacts. What are some of the other categories of speech that the government suppressed with its unconstitutional scheme? Well, uh, the court made findings on that. I just quote them, opposition to COVID-19 vaccines, opposition to COVID-19 masking and lockdowns, the lab leak theory of COVID-19, opposition to President Biden's policies, statements that the Hunter Biden laptop story was true, opposition to the policies of government officials in power, 
all were suppressed. And that's just some examples, many other examples in the, in the court's findings and in the discovery in the case. I so wish I weren't out of time. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Allred from Texas for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time to Ms. Plaskett. I want to thank the gentleman from Texas. <clears throat> Mr. Kennedy's and others here are claiming that they've been censored, but they actually have a huge megaphone. The rules that my colleague tried to bring up were rules that the Republicans made at the beginning of this Congress. They did not allow the Democrats to be part of that. And one of those rules was that if information or testimony might potentially defame an individual, that we would go in executive session. No one was trying to stop him from testifying, but not to give him the megaphone that this group has allowed him to have. I also note, in terms of censorship, that the far right media has already issued articles about me playing the race card. The race card is something that's often used against black people for bringing up when they see race hatred being propagated against them. And it's a means to try and keep us quiet and keep us in our place. Oh, you're playing the race card by bringing up what is obvious in our lives, what is obviously happening, race. And so you can keep saying I'm race baiting and try and censor me, but I'm gonna to continue to tell the truth. I wanna be abundantly clear about what else is happening in this room. The MAGA Republicans are trying to scare social media companies into not taking down blatantly false information in the lead up to our 2024 presidential election. Chair Jordan knows, as we do, that when conspiracy theories succeed, so does Donald Trump. Russia interfered in our 2016 election, they attempted in our 2020, and they're going to try to interfere in the 2024 presidential election. We note that Russian trolls sought to suppress the black vote by unleashing a torrent of social media posts designed to stoke racial tensions and spread incorrect voting information. In 2021, our national intelligence agencies found that proactive information sharing between the government and social media companies facilitated the expeditious review and in many cases, removal of social media accounts covertly operated by Russia and Iran. Ms. Wiley, if the government is not able to proactively share information with social media companies in 2024, what is the likely what is likely to have uh, be the ramifications? And I'd ask that you make your answer as succinct as possible because there's a lot of information I need. I will just quote one thing. Mr. Prigozhin, who's been in the news of late, actually said explicitly and openly that they would continue to try to spread mis and disinformation into the United States and interfere with our elections. Thank you. Uh, they know that that Russian interference that is, the MAGA Republicans know that Trump benefits when Russia interferes. The super PAC that supports, uh, the same super PAC that supports Mr. Kennedy and has raised significant funds on his behalf is run by a man named Jason Bowles. Here's Jason Bowles' Twitter profile, uh, as you can see up on the screen. Jason Bowles isn't just a MAGA supporter. He also ran the super PAC for MAGA Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, George Santos, and in 2022, he supported Herschel Walker. So the person behind Mr. Kennedy's super PAC is an individual who personally and professionally wants the Republican Party to succeed. Yet, Mr. Kennedy is running as a Democrat. Ms. Wiley, will it benefit Mr. Kennedy as well as the other individuals that are supported by the super PAC if social media companies are less able to detect and if needed, if they determine that it's needed to remove Russian covert information designed to suppress votes in this country? It is possible. Thank you. I yield back. Can I uh, yield the remainder of the General time? The lady yields back. Um, I now recognize Mr. Stubbe from uh, Florida for his five minutes. Mr. Kennedy, do you want to respond to that? Can you do that quickly? Yeah, I, I've never heard of Mr. Bowles, and I've never heard of that super PAC. Uh, this is typical of the accusations against me at this hearing. They are baseless. Every single one I've been subjected to a string, a parade of defamations. If I believe those things about myself, I wouldn't want to hear me either. They'd want to gag me and 
lock me in a room somewhere. But none of those are true, and they were all, all of this parade of accusations and defamations were made against me in a way that was calculated to make sure that I could not respond to any of them. Every one of them I'd like to respond to, but I was not allowed to. Uh, to further the disinformation going on, uh, Ms. Wiley, in a response to a question, you stated that the decision in Missouri v. Biden was vacated by the appellate court. Is that correct? I did, and I want to correct that because Mr. Sauer is right. The appropriate word is stayed. Administratively stayed. So it hasn't been vacated stayed. or dismissed like Mrs. Sanchez it's said. It's stayed, which means it cannot be implemented right now. Okay, because I, you know, I didn't want us to censor your disinformation that you stated as a factual assertion earlier. So I did misspeak, uh, and I apologize. Thank you for clarifying that for us. And to talk about more evidence about, uh, I think it's interesting, there's a lot in this opinion, and I just, you know, I have limited time, but I think illustrating some of the actions that the Biden administration took to, to censor speech is very important. I'm gonna read specifically from the opinion. Explicit threats are an obvious form of coercion, but not all coercion needs be explicit. I'm on page 97 of the opinion. The following illustrative specific actions by defendants are examples of coercion exercised by the White House defendants. A, cannot stress the degree to which this needs to be resolved immediately. Please remove this count immediately. Sounds like a directive from the White House to me to social media companies. Accused Facebook of causing political violence by failing to censor false COVID-19 claims. F, this is exactly why I want to know what reduction actually looks like. If reduction means pumping our most vaccine hesitant audience with Tucker Carlson saying it does not work, then I'm not sure it's reduction, implying that they're reducing uh, the information on that. Questioning how the Tucker Carlson video had been demoted since there were 40,000 shares. Wanting to know why Alex Berenson had not been kicked off Twitter because Berenson was the epicenter of disinformation and radiated outward to the pers persuadable public. And I'm just skipping through here. I'm not even going through all these. Flatterly stated, not to sound like a broken record, but how much content is being demoted and how effective are you at mitigating reach and how quickly? Flattery told Facebook, are you guys effing serious? I want an answer on what happened here and I want it today. Sounds like a pretty explicit threat to me. Number, uh, letter M, White House Press Secretary Saki stated, and I quote, we are in regular touch with these social media platforms and those engagements typically happen through members of our senior staff, but also members of our COVID-19 team. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook that spread disinformation. Saki also stated, one of the White House asks of social media companies was to create a robust enforcement strategy. Oh, Saki stated on the February 1st, 2022 White House press conference that the White House wanted every social media platform to do more to call out misinformation and disinformation and to uplift accurate information. Another one, hey folks, wanted to flag the below tweet and I'm wondering if we can get moving on the process of having it removed ASAP. Sounds like a pretty explicit uh, demand from the White House to me. Again, quoting the opinion, these actions are just a few examples of the unrelenting pressure the defendants exerted against social media companies. This court finds the above examples demonstrate that plaintiffs can likely prove, likely prove, the White House defendants engaged in coercion to induce social media companies to suppress free speech. Uh, Mr. Sauer, in the limited time that I have, can you just comment further on, these are just some of the highlights that are in the opinion, and illustrate to us all of the evidence of the White House censoring the American public and working with social media companies to accomplish that. Yeah, it's very telling that the judicial findings uh, are quite specific on the specific threats. So there's several ways you can violate the First Amendment if you're a government official. One is coercion, one is significant encouragement, one is joint participation where you've insinuated yourselves into private decision making. The court found all of those present here. And with respect to those White House communications, there's a series of specific judicial findings that these statements were threatening. They were threatening adverse legal consequences. There's multiple findings, for example, that uh, White House spokesperson Saki's public statements explicitly linked the threat of adverse legal consequences to the White House's demands for censorship, which we didn't know at the time, but now know were being very aggressively peppered on the social media platforms while she was making those public statements. So you have public statements from the White House. Also, uh, uh, White House Communications Director Bedingfield, there's a very specific judicial finding on that. Threatening adverse legal consequences in public if there's not greater censorship. And in private, you've got Rob Flaherty, Andy Slavitt, other White House officials saying, 
take this down, take this down, I'm, do more to take down borderline I'm, content. Time of the gentleman that's expired. Uh, Mr. Gentleman, Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous consent request. Gentleman from Louisiana. There's a lot of talk about this uh, preliminary injunction, so I'd like to enter into the record 155-page court opinion, the memorandum ruling on request for preliminary injunction in the matter of State of Missouri and Louisiana v. Biden uh, from the U.S. District Court, Western District, Louisiana, Monroe Division, and also the Fifth Circuit's administrative stay, yep. which does not address the merits. I yield back. Uh, with, uh, without objection. Mr. Chair, I'd like the unanimous consent to enter into the record an article um, that say it's pro F RFK Jr. Super PAC has deep ties to Marjorie Taylor Greene, George Santos, which discusses the Super PAC titled Heal the Divide, which states that only Robert F. Kennedy Jr. can unite the nation and start healing America, and also discusses Mr. Kennedy's discussions with Mr. Trump about working in his administration. Uh, without objection, uh, the, the chair now recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Texas, I believe is, is that the cue? Thank you. Uh, Mr. You recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I live in Houston, but I was born and raised in rural South Texas. Uh, and shamefully, rural South Texas uh, and all of rural Texas has been utterly devastated by COVID-19. In fact, only 56% of rural Americans are fully vaccinated versus almost 70% of their urban counterparts. And we know that being unvaccinated makes you up to 17 times, 17 times more likely to die of COVID compared to people who are vaccinated and boosted. A recent study found that nearly 2,000 lives could have been saved in Texas if it had reached the vaccination levels of places like Vermont, or Connecticut. However, today, despite the horrific COVID-19 tragedies, and thank you for describing those refrigerated morgues, if you will, because that was horrible to even see, but I'm sure there are some deniers just like to deny the climate that that even happened. But these tragedies have also plagued rural South Texas and families all around the country, we, but yet we give a platform to one of the biggest spreaders of anti-vaccine propaganda in the country. He has claimed that vaccines have caused widespread death. They have not. He has claimed that vaccines are unsafe for pregnant people. They are not. He has claimed that vaccines cause autism. They do not. He has even suggested that vaccines implant government-controlled microchips into patients. They do not. As crazy as Mr. Kennedy's theories are, he has been able to effectively spray, spread false medical information throughout our communities due to his prestigious family's name, his big pocket, deep pockets, and his websites that publish patently false health and medical information. By inviting him here today, extreme mega Republicans elevate a man who tells others that vaccines aren't safe, but, but vaccines his own children for protection. And it was noted earlier, even ask guests to his party to be vaccinated. Three million lives were saved by the COVID-19 vaccine. And if anti-vaccine advocates like Mr. Kennedy did not continuously flood our communities with false health and medical information, more lives could have been saved. Ms. Wiley, thank you for your opening remarks because that was the reality that New York and so many communities across the country faced. We know that sensational false information, information spreads much faster than accurate information. From your personal experience, is that true? Uh, it, it is true. And actually, one of the ways that the social media companies, which are the places where the rules are determined, and I think it's important when we keep talking about censorship, that they have, a, the, they have the power and the legal right to decide what content is on their site. And we're talking about their policies here and their enforcement or failure to enforce them. We've actually raised alarm bells at the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights about the fact that they have not sufficiently enforced their own policies and that this has led to harm, very dangerous harm, which we've talked about. Uh, but I just want to point this out as well. The social media companies actually use algorithms it's to elevate content that it finds draws users. And that's why there is research that shows 
far from suppressing right-wing and extremist speech, that actually the algorithm, uh, algorithms used by social media has elevated them has elevated them. And that's true from the New York Stern School that has a study out from 2021. That testimony, I think, has occurred in Congress. But even Twitter's own analytics shows that it has elevated conservative speech, which, by the way, that shows and that research shows that while we're sitting here talking about this as if there is somehow a targeting of viewpoint, it's actually been about targeting whether or not the content is consistent with the policies of the platforms that they themselves set. So this year, and really, it's literally putting even more lives at risk for elevating all these, what I think are crazy theories. Uh, because in, as long as all this anti-vaccine theories are continue to spread, it makes people not only question uh, the vaccine, but other vaccines, wouldn't you agree? I, I would, and I also want to say it also incurs in, in, in our democracy in terms of voting, uh, mis- and disinformation about whether or not voting laws are being violated and whether individuals are violating them have left um, to death threats. That is also in violation of the social media policy. The gentlelady has expired. Well, the it, chair, it chair now recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hagan, for five minutes. I got a death threat after the last weaponization here. Time belongs to the gentlelady from Wyoming. I want to thank you, Mr. Sauer, Ms. Morris, and Mr. Kennedy, for your courage, for your willingness to be the tip of the spear to protect all of our First Amendment rights. Mr. Sauer, I don't know if you watched the testimony from Christopher Ray last week, but he testified and admitted that the FBI was continuing to meet regularly with social media companies up until the very moment that the injunction was issued by the district court judge. What that tells me is they're not stopping. They're going to continue to try to further the censorship industrial complex as long as they can, and will continue to attempt to violate our First Amendment rights. We all must be vigilant. Ms. Morris, I want to focus on you today. I don't think that we've talked enough about the freedom of the press, but it's also included in the First Amendment and is as important as any other First Amendment right that we have. I want to thank you for your testimony today, and we all know that the First Amendment is a core fundamental right Within its protection of the free, is the protection of the free press against infringement by the government. Free press has been an institution in this nation which dates back to even before America existed. Americans have always relied on the media to remain informed about the workings of their government and events in the world. This is why the press is often referred to as the fourth branch, using the rights secured by the Constitution as a fourth check on the three branches of government. Ms. Morris, before a majority presidential election, you were prepared to release a factual report about one of the candidates. One would think that the information in your report would be of interest to the American people to understand the integrity of the candidates who are asking for their support and their trust. The facts have been laid out by you and this committee of how the FBI worked with social media to alter their perception of what your story was and to change their policies to censor it. Ms. Morris, your story was obviously groundbreaking news. And as we have learned and uncovered additional information over the intervening two years, I can say with confidence that what has been going on with the Biden family is, it absolutely, it is, is absolutely horrific and undermines the very foundation of our country and our, the integrity of the people in the highest, highest elected and appointed offices in this country. Um, but it's now, we, we know that you were correct in what you were going to be reporting. Has there been any estimates or do you have any general idea of how many people were denied access to your story because of the government censorship? So there are polls about that. Um, the MRC Media Research Center did a poll about, you know, it said 45% uh, uh, of Biden voters were not aware of the story. Um, but I think it also is an impossible question to answer because the thing about the censorship was not only that it was, you know, deleted or whatever from Twitter, but also um, it casted an aspersion on, on the reporting, on me, that was literally made up. It was made up. And there is a subset of this country where despite the New York Times, the Washington Post, like literally fill in the blank, like liberal news legacy outlet that um, they all trust, 
they'll, like, they just reflexively think um, laptop from hell, fake, uh, Russia, whatever. Um, and so the, the effect of that can't be measured because like these, these people who are spies, who the country looks at as the ultimate authority of truth, came out and said that this was, um, there, there was something wrong with it. So you can't measure the impact of that. And so going back to the legacy media, uh, the Oversight Committee had a very explosive hearing yesterday with whistleblowers from the IRS. Some of our leg legacy media uh, outlets did not cover the hearing, but they did talk about Taco Tuesday, and they talked about other things that seemed to be of great interest to them, uh -huh. but not the fact that we are uncovering an enormous amount of corruption at the very highest levels in our government. Um, while we don't, while you don't know about the F, you didn't know about the FBI's efforts at the time. I would assume that between the Twitter files and what we've uncovered in the uh, Missouri versus Biden case, you now know the role that the FBI played in censoring your work. Do you think the FBI tried to ensure that the American people didn't hear the story in order to change the outcome of the election in 2020? I. I don't know how to answer that question because I'm not in their head. I don't know, um, you know, the reason why. Um, I know I don't have a head count of how many Biden voters work at the FBI. I, I can't assign a motive to them. I can just tell you what happened and and what we've learned in the two years since this like, blatant, in-your-face censorship um, event. But we do know that the American public were not told the truth about the Hunter Biden laptop and Joe Biden's involvement with his dealings, foreign dealings. Well, that's it. And that's, that's what pertains to my work and my experience. Thank you. General Lady Yields back. The gentleman from... Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentle lady from uh, Florida, Ms. Kamek. <clears throat> Um, maybe use slide over. Yeah. Sorry, the microphone is broken. Oh, wait, that might work. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, this microphone is broken. I want to thank all our witnesses for being in front of us here today. I know that this has not been an easy couple of hours, but I appreciate your endurance. Uh, I'll start with you, Ms. Wiley. Five days ago, Democrat Representative uh, Pramila Jayapal stated that she has been, quote, fighting to make it clear that Israel is a racist state. Yes or no, do you believe that statement to be anti-Semitic? Uh, I, I, I believe that there is a distinction between uh, any conversation yes no. about a government versus a group of people. So do you believe that each of my Democratic colleagues should publicly denounce her comments well, and not continue to give her a platform to make statements like Israel is a racist nation? Because essentially that is what is happening here is it is we, we are 100 percent trying to censor one gentleman because one side doesn't agree with his comments. So in a weaponization hearing about censorship, the left is trying to censor, which I, I think is absolutely crazy. And I, I have to bring this up. And, and since the, the, the door was opened, uh, you know, I, I'm deeply concerned about the fact that there were FEC reports brought up. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, you acknowledge that you don't know where those came from. Uh, you said that you have no affiliation with those, uh, that PAC, that super PAC, I believe. Um, uh, the ranking member said she was deeply concerned um, about the affiliation. And we seem to have a guilty by association theme going on here. And so I just have to state for the record that I myself am deeply concerned about the affiliation of the convicted sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein, of which the ranking member took campaign donation money from. So I think that's the beauty of the First Amendment is that we have a right to say what we want to say, but we also have the right to be offended. So I just wanted to point that out, you know, glass houses and all. Our Democrat colleague, Mr. Lynch, opened up the door of what does the impact of the continued narrative of weaponization have on the general public? And I think that's really important because what we have seen 
in the last couple of weeks is irrefutable evidence of the fact that the FBI has not only been systematically working to censor American speech, but they have been facilitating it, and in some cases at the behest of foreign governments. A weaponization report proved that there was a direct connection between the Ukrainian SBU in which that intelligence service was sending spreadsheets of thousands of posts in some cases, posts that were belonging to the United States State Department. And because we know that the Ukrainian SBU is rife with double agents, the FBI wasn't even vetting the posts. They were simply sending them direct to the social media companies saying, please take these down. So now we have an FBI that is not just saying that they're going to fight foreign interference, they're facilitating it at one point even suggesting that they put forward a 24-7 channel where the FBI takes requests from a foreign government and filters it right to the social media company to have those posts taken down. And it was across the board, anti-Ukraine, pro-Ukraine. That right there proves that they weren't vetting the posts. That's a problem. We've established clearly with hard evidence that there is in fact a weaponization of the federal government against the American people and every single day that we do not acknowledge it is a bad day in America. The pillars of our constitutional republic, not democracy, are being taken down bit by bit because the press is being told they can't ask the tough questions. Ms. Morris, you have probably received threats. You have been censored. You have been silenced. Mr. Sauer, you have been before us many times and you have expressed the pushback, the threats that you have received. Mr. Kennedy, I can't imagine what you receive on a daily basis from both the left and the right. So I'm going to go to our Democratic colleague, Mr. Lynch, and ask the question, what impact does the continued narrative of weaponization have on the general public? I know he framed this in a way to make a point that it is somehow negative to ask the tough questions, but I'm going to ask our three witnesses here, what are the ramifications if we don't talk about it, if we don't expose it? And I only have 25 seconds, so Mr. Sauer, take it away. If federal censorship is not stood up to aggressively, it will expand to every corner of online discourse. Ms. Morris. It's, it's just this, I can't even believe this is a conversation. Like, this is not controversial or taboo. We live in the United States of America, and you have the right to say whatever you want, to print whatever you want, and to read whatever you want. Mr. Kennedy. I, 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 a government that can censor its critics has license for every atrocity. It is the beginning of totalitarianism. There's never been a time in history when we look back and the guys who were censoring people were the good guys. All of us grew up reading Arthur Kessler, Robert Heinlein, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, and they were all saying the same thing. Once you start censoring, you're on your way to dystopia and totalitarianism. And I know my time has expired, but Mr. Sauer, you said earlier, censorship is about power. Censorship is about control. And the entire progressive leftist agenda is about nothing more than dependency and control. That is why this is so empower important. With that, I yield back. Gentleman, yields back. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chairman. before that, I have um, a document I'd like to enter into the record or Washington Post article of July 23rd, which lists the misstates, misstatements of facts in the preliminary injunction um, in the Missouri v. Biden case that we've been talking about. And from what paper? What publication? I said the Washington Post. Okay. Thank Without you. Without objection. Mm -hmm. the gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sauer, welcome back to the committee. It's great to see you again. You're becoming a mainstay on the committee, and, and I do hope that uh, you continue to update us on your case uh, now that it has been stayed and will not be implemented as it goes through the appeals process. Uh, I'd like to quickly play a, a short video, if we could. COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and, and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. Mr. Kennedy, I have a simple question for you. As an early victim of COVID, I actually got it uh, March 10th, 2020. And, and my question to you 
is whether you think I should be worried about my genetics as an Ashkenazi Jew because I did contract COVID. No, not at all. And that statement that you saw there is a truncated version of a larger statement. No, I understand. You, you issued a, a clarification. Where I was I describing, it, I, I was I understand. Hold on. I just, I had a I was simple question. You're now going study. on. I'm reclaiming my time. Because what I really want to talk about here is evidence. Evidence, evidence, evidence. Mr. Johnson was so eager to talk about what he called the hard evidence, and yet all we heard again was him repeating allegations without identifying any evidence. You can repeat all of these allegations as much as you want, but it doesn't make them true. Well, the gentleman, you, you are not witnesses. I don't have enough time, unfortunately. Yeah. You are not witnesses to any of this conduct, and just because you say it over and over, it doesn't make it so. And if we're talking about censorship here, which I believe is presumably the reason why Mr. Kennedy is here, the tweet that you've identified was never taken down. Whatever the government may have tried to do, and I don't, I don't agree that it tried to do what you said it did, it wasn't taken down. So how can the government actually censor anyone if there's enough freedom within the companies they're talking to that they reject whatever request that the government makes? I want to focus now, Ms. Morris, on the laptop. There's been a lot of talk about the laptop being real, and that is true. There was a laptop, it's a computer, keyboard, screen, it is, it is real, but you never got a laptop before you wrote that story, did you? That's correct. You got a hard drive. Hard drive. And you received that hard drive from Rudy Giuliani, right? Yep. Okay. Who had been openly associating with an agent of Russian intelligence in the months leading up to your story. You agree with that, right? I uh, guess. Now, did you do a forensic examination of that hard drive before you printed your story? Uh, we had tech people in the post looking at it, yes, yes. That's a, that's a forensic analysis? No, not... Uh, I, I highly doubt that? the New York Post has the ability to do a forensic analysis of a, of a hard drive. Okay. Um, Ms. Morris, were you the uh, primary drafter of this article? That, yes. Bruce Golding was not the primary author? No. Drafter? No. Did he, uh, did he help with the, uh, with the article? Yes. And then isn't it true that he decided to withdraw his name from the byline because of concerns that he had? I wasn't involved with that. Well, isn't it true whether you were involved in it or not? I don't know the details. But he did withdraw his name from the byline. His name was not published. Right. Well, I'd like to introduce for the record a, an article in the New York Times uh, that uh, says the first line is New York Post front page article about Hunter Biden was written mostly by a staff reporter who refused to put his name on it, two Post employees said. Now, I, I would note um, you also said that this uh, article was determinative of the election, but there was a pause for 24 hours, and there was a tremendous controversy. And there is no doubt that this article received far more attention because of the controversy than it would if it had ever, ever been uh, published uh, without any controversy. And it is odd to hear my colleagues and Ms. Morris talk about their uh, somehow expert knowledge about whether it affected the election, because we're not hearing a lot about Jim Comey although one of my colleagues did say that he interfered in the 2016 election, and that is correct. He interfered on behalf of Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton by unnecessarily announcing of an investigation six days before. The, the majority would like us to believe that there's some broad government conspiracy, but in reality, this government is playing by the book. That is why Joe Biden's Justice Department has allowed a Trump-appointed uh, U.S. attorney to continue its in, his investigation of the president's son, which is in direct contrast to what the former president did by weaponizing the Justice Department. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself. Hard evidence. Mr. Johnson said that uh, we're not only witnesses to censorship, we were victims. The Republican website on the House Judiciary Committee posted this story and it was limited where it could go. You got to, they, 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 they exercise censorship of the House Judiciary Republican account, for goodness sake. Ms. Wiley, 
Uh, you were a lawyer for the ACLU? I was. Mr. Kennedy, I remember when the ACLU defended the first, they were the champions of the First Amendment. You remember that? You remember that ACLU? <clears throat> I remember when the ACLU represented Nazis who they, uh, who, who they were appalled by. Appalled, disgusted right. by, and yet they would defend the crazy things they said, right? That, that's how much the First Amendment meant to them, right? Exactly. I want to go back to where Mr. Stubbe was. I want to talk about this hard evidence that Mr. Goldman says doesn't exist. I want to read from the, from the facts. This is what the White House was saying. I want to go to just three statements. One, cannot stress the degree. This is statements from, our, from the Biden White House to social media. Cannot stress the degree to which this needs to be resolved immediately. Please remove this account immediately. Same kind of thing they put on yours. Remove ASAP. But here's the, here's the better one. Here's the better one. Mr. Flaherty, who ran this COVID operation misinformation concept at the White House, Mr. Flaherty said this, not to sound like a broken record, how much content is being demoted and how effective are you at mitigating reach and how quickly? And we should just translate that because this is real simple. How much censorship are you doing it? How much censorship are you doing and how quickly are you doing it? But I think the kicker is what Jin Psaki, the press secretary, said back in 2021. Look at this. Now think about this. The press secretary, I mean, they, they we're talking about the White House, considered the center of freedom on the planet. The press secretary in the press room says this. We are in regular touch with these social media platforms, and those engagements typically happen through members of our senior staff, but also members of our COVID-19 team. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook that spread disinformation, their definition, of course. Saki also stated one of the White House asks was of social media companies to create a robust enforcement strategy. So you got the press secretary in the press room in the White House saying we're going to limit the press. Now that is frightening. That is frightening. And Ms. Wiley from the ACLU, lawyer with the ACLU, thinks that's somehow appropriate. We know it's not. And their number one target, Mr. Kennedy, was you. Was you, a Democrat, their primary opponent. I, I just, I find that, I find that amazing. And I would just like, I would like any thoughts you may have on, because here's the scary thing. And Dennis and I had this conversation a while back. If you, if you don't have a robust First Amendment, if you try to restrict what the people say and what the press reports, that is a scary place to go. Because if you can't have debate and work out our differences, like you said in your amazing opening statement, let's work together, let's figure this out. But if you can't have that robust debate and figure things out, the alternative is scary. And that's exactly where we're headed. And I would, I would encourage everyone to read Mr. Kennedy's written statement. I read it this morning. Amazing. He walks through the history here. That is what's at stake. And that's why what you're doing, whether we agree with what you say or not, and we, I disagree with what you said last week, what they played. I think a lot of people did. You've, 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 you've clarified it. But... It's about protecting the Constitution and the First Amendment. And I'll give you the last minute and a half, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, well, you know, what I would say is that the, the, the founders of our, and the framers of our Constitution knew that democracy was a very inefficient system, and it had all of these kind of built-in inefficiencies and difficulties. But they said that it, they felt that it would give us the one thing that would give us an advantage over totalitarian systems was this capacity for the free flow of information and, and a complete lack of control of debate so that ideas that would eventually mature into policies would be annealed in a furnace of debate and then rise through the marketplace of ideas rather than being dictated from above. And that's what would give the energy, the vibrancy, the vigor the democracy. When they invented this democracy, we were the first one in the modern era in 1780. By 1865, five other nations had imitated us. I, today, it's 190 nations based upon our system. We are supposed to be the exemplary democracy, and the corner foundation stone of our system is freedom of speech. All of the other freedoms depend on it. If we lose that, not only do we lose our democracy in this country, but the entire world exactly. loses us as an Ex example. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better. Now I recognize the gentleman from uh, Kentucky. Mr. Chairman, I have an unanimous consent request. Gentleman, say the request. Uh, as for unanimous consent to enter the record, an article by the New York Times on July the 20th, 2023, New York Post published Hunter Biden report amid newsroom doubts. 
That's for unanimous <laughs> consent. You can, without objection. Thank uh, you. Some, some things amaze me. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky is recognized, and this, is, uh, this will be our, our, our last line of questioning. One of the immutable and undeniable uh, tenets of immunology is natural immunity. But for two years, it was denied. It wasn't even just denied, it was censored. Mr. Sauer, I noticed in the court ruling, um, in the case that you worked on, uh, that they said that, the court said that Facebook reported to the White House that it labeled and demoted posts suggesting natural immunity to a COVID-19 infection is superior to vaccine immunity. Is that true? Was, was that kind of censorship going on? Yes, that kind of censorship was going on, and there were direct communications between the platforms and federal officials about natural immunity specifically that I think you've correctly quoted. And um, thanks to the Twitter files, we found out that the former FDA director who was on the board of Pfizer, Ms. Dr. Scott Gottlieb, wrote on August 27, 2021, to Twitter executive Todd O'Boyle, who, by the way, was kind of one of the go-to people for the White House also to coordinate with when they wanted something suppressed, uh, requested Twitter take action against a post about natural immunity. Uh, you know, what's amazing to me is Scott Gottlieb, who works for Pfizer, who's a former FDA director, went to Twitter the day I got censored on natural immunity, my post, a congressional post. Now, the other side said, well, your, your tweet's still up, your post is still up, what do you mean you're getting censored? What they did is they labeled it and they denied anybody's ability to, to actually comment on it, and they de-boosted it. So I simply said natural immunity is better than vaccine immunity. We had studies showing that. They took it, they, they censored it. So the next day I tried it again with a reference to Bloomberg, Bloomberg hardly a right-wing um, outlet at, or, or conspiracy generator, and they censored that one as well. This, this is astounding to me. Mr. Kennedy, can you talk about the uh, censorship, the effort of the White House and pharma to suppress the acknowledgement of natural immunity and, and why they might have been doing that? Well, again, it, it was an effort uh, to suppress information, not uh, the, in fact, if you read the Twitter files and the email correspondence at, uh, between Facebook and the White House, there was an acknowledgement that they were being asked and they were complying with censoring information that everybody knew to be true or highly likely to be true. Oh, the purpose, and in fact, the term misinformation did not denote uh, falsehood or, or veracity. Rather, it was a euphemism mm -hmm. for any information that departed from government orthodoxies. And it is very dangerous. And you know, uh, the, uh, the congressman a minute ago said a million people have died because of mis misinformation about vaccines in this country. But in fact, our country had the worst, had one of the highest vaccination rates in the world and the worst health outcomes. We have 4.2% of the global population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. Blacks in Haiti with a 1% vaccination rate were dying at a rate of 15 per million population. And same in Nigeria, had a 1.3 vaccination rate. They were dying at one in 14 per million population, 14 per million population. In our country, blacks were dying at 3,000 per million population, 200 times the death rates in other countries. And this holds throughout the world. We needed information. We should have all been sharing information openly and, and talking to the 15 million doctors through the internet who were treating patients on the front line all over the world and channeling the best therapies, the most successful treatments so that we can all figure it out. We, this is not a time in a pandemic to, uh, to you know, I'll just say this one thing. Trusting the experts is not a function of science. It's not a function of democracy. It's a function of religion and totalitarianism, and it does not make for a healthier population. Mm. Let, let me ask you this. You, you referenced your, your father and your uncle and the, the, the party that they were in. What has happened to your party with respect to the First Amendment? Would they recognize the position now? I, you know, I think... Listen, I'm a Democrat, 
And I, you know, and I believe in all the, if you went through a checklist of all of the things that my father believed in, that he fought for, that my uncle believed in and fought for, I, I would check every box. I feel my party is departing, has departed from some of those core values. And one of the reasons that I want to run for president is to reclaim my party for those. But it's got to, you know, listen, this is not a partisan issue. The First Amendment, it just seems crazy to me that anybody thinks that it's okay to censor. And there's a lot of information that I don't like. There's hateful information, but as the chairman was saying, in 1977, the ACLU went out and, and supported Nazis who were walking through a Jewish neighborhood in Skokie, Illinois. And they said, that's important. We're, we hate what they're saying. We're repulsed by it. But we cannot survive as a democracy if we, if we, if we are not ready to die for the right for even people who are, who are appalling to speak. The, the democracy won't work, unfortunately. There's no other way to control it but through the First Amendment and free speech. Amen, and thank you for those comments. Um, the time the gentleman has expired. I, I, Frank Mayor, I have, I have one, one other question I could ask, but I, I would first give you a chance to ask the question if you had. I just have one quick question for Mr. Kennedy. But I, I want to be fair. If you got, if you got an extra question you want to ask Ms. Weiler and the witnesses, I'll turn to you first. Wasn't prepared for that, so well, if you sorry, just give me I a just second. Have, I, thought, I thought I was going to get 15 seconds from Mr. Massey, but we weren't able to do that. Sure. Thank you, sir. Um, I did want to ask Ms. Wiley regarding, we had a discussion and it was brought up by one of the witnesses um, related to the website Gab. Um, and if you could tell us, it seems to me that while Mr. Kennedy is here, he claims to have been censored. But in reality, his group Children's Health Defense has been allowed to say whatever they want on GAB. Can you share what GAB is? Uh, GAB is a online community um, that it, it explicitly states that it wants to create a, a Christian political economy. And it is a space where researchers have identified a, a massive influx of um, extremist uh, and also explicitly anti-Semitic engagement and behavior. Not saying that's about everyone who participates, but that has been documented. And as I stated earlier, uh, the murderer, convicted murderer in the Tree of Life massacre uh, actually spent a lot of time on that. And it was deplatformed because it was not, was not adhering to um, some of the, so the social media policies about identifying um, that kind of speech. Thank you. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Johnson have our, our arm one minute here, but I think he wants to wait for Mr. Kennedy to. Well, I can be asking to Mr. Sauer. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry that Mr. Goldman left because we talked a lot about evidence. Isn't it true in your litigation, Missouri v. Biden? that Elvis Chan, who was one of the FBI agents in charge of the FBI online censorship program, testified under oath in the litigation, and the court noted it in the opinion, that 50, he had a 50% success rate. In, in other words, when the FBI brought to the social media platforms content or posts that they said was you know, disfavored speech for whatever reason, 50% of it was taken down. Isn't that true? That's correct. And is there any other glaring piece of evidence that Mr. Goldman might have missed in his review of that uh, outcome, if, you, if we've got a second or two here? There's so much evidence, I couldn't possibly summarize it all. 82 pages of factual findings, tens of thousands of pages of, of emails and other documents, uh, six full-length depositions. And, you know, I just quote what the U.S. Department of Justice attorney said at oral argument in front of Judge Doty on May 26. He said, how can I be sure that this won't happen again? And she answered, it's not the government's position that this will never happen again. To be fair, I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, I want to thank our witnesses uh, for, for being here today. Um, we appreciate the work you're doing to, uh, to defend the First Amendment. Um, and uh, thank you for just very compelling answers and compelling testimony and the work you've done and um, how important this is for the country. I mean, if we don't have a First Amendment, it's just, I'm, I'm frightened by where we go. May, may I, Mr. Chairman? You may not. You may not. I just Mr. want Chair. to respond. Mr. Chair. 
I don't the time think, is out. We're done. I don't. I haven't adjourned the hearing, and I don't I, think you're the chair. I want to, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I this. Chairman's discretion. I know it's your Kennedy, discretion. We're going to let Mr. Kennedy. Mr. He has had so much additional time. Well, I think everyone's had why? additional time. No, why? Get, why are you doing that specifically because, for him? Because we I just don't want to, to explain. Other I'm sure that with super pack. I'm sure the Democratic witness places. will be as short as he possibly can. No, no. no. are you going to allow our witness to just give another piece? No, of let him address the defamatory comment that was made about him. That's untrue. There, I want that was not defamatory. That is a legal definition that was not met. I want to acknowledge information about the super PAC that you mentioned. Go ahead. I've just been told that that super PAC is connected to somebody that we have a connection to. It's not a super PAC that I've endorsed, and it's not one, as I said, that I've ever heard of. Thank the gentleman uh, for uh, that statement, and I thank you for your testimony. The committee is now adjourned.